So this is the final one of our Lent series, which is Christian, well, Climate Action in the Wilderness. And uh, the title for this session, which I have to say, I just sort of pulled out of the hat <laughs> weeks ago now, it feels like. But the title that I sort of kind of popped into my head was The Cloud and the Fire being led through the wilderness. So this is the final Lent talk um, as part of this series. And I did just say earlier that unfortunately I haven't been able to listen to all of them. I wanted to do, and they are gonna be put up, but they're not yet available. So if I do repeat anything that's been said, <laughs> hopefully um, it, yeah, it will, <laughs> it will be said in a slightly different way, uh, but apologies. Cause I did want to listen to all of them before I did this. Um, so, get my script up um so the cloud and the fire being led through the wilderness let's let the final people come in so i'm drawing this uh you probably know i mean the story of exodus is one of the more familiar stories in the bible and um part of this story is god leads uh, the people through the wilderness in this sort of incredible uh, manifest presence. The Bible describes a sort of cloud by day and a fire by night. And it's one of these mysterious sort of parts of the story where we're left to sort of imagine, well, what would have that have been like to have this sort of cloud uh, that both goes ahead and then also at one point when the Israelites are crossing the Red Sea, it describes how God and the clouds sort of go behind to protect. So there's a sense that this cloud and this fire are protective, but they're also somehow leading and guiding. So somehow God is sort of manifestly present. And, uh, and we hear how the cloud, um, the Israelites don't move until the cloud moves. So there's a real sense that somehow they're being sort of, mysteriously led and that they they are in this relationship with God where they seem to be very dependent on God moving before they move so that's the that's the that's the story that I'm drawing on for this um, Saturday session and I just wanted to start by talking a little bit about this theme of wilderness and I guess why I think it's so deeply relevant for us uh, with the climate crisis and this sort of seminal moment that our civilization is in really. And I think that this image of wilderness applies across so much because the wilderness is essentially a place of transition. You know, any deep change involves a journey into the unknown. It means that you set out uh, towards a different kind of future, but you have to make the journey. Um, you have to leave the familiar. So in this case, in the Bible story, it involves leaving Egypt, um, something that for the Israelites was very oppressive, but it was known. And they have to set out into this potentially inhospitable, uninhabited territory. It's a land that hasn't been, they haven't traveled before. And it's not a land that's occupied in that sense. Um, it's a land that's yet to be explored. Uh, and that kind of journey inevitably involves a big risk. It means that you're vulnerable. You're not in control. You don't know what you're going to find. Uh, how will you get what you need to survive? You're going to be tested and stretched. And you're going to need to dig deep to find inner and outer resources. So that is the, that this is part of the process of what transition or change necessarily involves. And the journey that we see Israel take, un, you know, it involves all of those things. And it's probably the case with this kind of change that most probably will not take, undertake such a journey. You know, it's something in our human nature that we don't naturally just go all right i'm gonna i'm gonna step out into the wilderness now hey let's go for a little picnic <laughs> you know it's it's something that we probably resist because we know in our hearts it's going to be really hard and um 
And I think with Israel, so, you know, we, we see that in reality, most of us don't undertake these deep journeys to change until our lives and conditions are so bad that we don't get an alternative. And most of us can probably think about moments in our lives when life has, you know, we've reached a point where we just have to make the change, but we have to reach that point. You know, there's many stories about people who struggle with all sorts of things, including addiction. And until you make, until you reach that point, you're not ready to make that journey. And with the Israelites, we see that they spent 430 years in Egypt before they make this journey. And we read in the story how their situation gets really, really bad. And it has to get pretty bad. And, you know, we hear about them groaning and crying. And there's a sense that it's got so bad that the exodus can now happen. Um, and I think if we look at our society today, we could say that we probably have not yet reached that point where our society is ready to leave Egypt. You know, where there is enough of that kind of awakening groaning and crying out for change um, we have to be honest and say probably the majority are not yet ready to embrace the kind of journey of change and transformation that we need to make um, that the majority haven't yet realized that we have to make this journey there isn't a choice we're not yet at that point you know, the journey of transition, literally that journey of transition of fossil fuels, but also that deeper journey where we have to reset our fundamental goals and values and priorities. What, what is our vision for a better world? So that we're prepared to redefine our notions of prosperity and progress and learn to live in a very different kind of relationship to each other and the earth. So as a society, somehow we need to get to the point where we're willing to undertake that kind of journey of change. And I think the really serious question is whether we're going to be willing to do this before we reach certain levels of disaster and catastrophe. And that is a real question. Um, however, we know that some of us, some have already started the journey. You know, it's never going to be the case that we all do it together in a kind of, it's not going to be the case like with Israel. We all mass transit together. We're in a much more messy process where some, some set off before us. <laughs> we might say, well, we're now on that journey. Um, so there are a significant number who have begun the journey. Um, but as we're all aware, it's yet to become this bigger movement within our society. But there are signs and there are pioneers who are making the journey. So today, what I want to speak about, I want to speak to this process of transition, which is the wilderness. Particularly for those who feel we're already in this wilderness, that we've already set out. We've already left the status quo um, behind us and we know that we're in this different landscape we're trying to find our way we see the world differently we've crossed the red sea as it were and pharaoh is dead to us and we can only go forwards even though we're not sure of the way and how we're going to get there and i think i want to speak to that feeling that experience that we're in of being in the wilderness and how we might embrace it more fully, how we might even welcome it and how we can um, acknowledge both that it's a massive challenge <laughs> to be on this journey, but it's also the making of us. Christians have traditionally read the story of the Israelites journey uh, of the wilderness almost like a parable um, as a picture of this process of what we call spiritual formation and they've they've kind of seen in that journey of the Israelites that is the process of inner transformation you know that we that we there are all sorts of long words for it but it's the process by how we really start to be changed 
and become more like Christ. And we sort of see in the Israelites kind of like we kind of look at them and go, gosh, we see all the ways that they resist that process, you know. Um, but we also have to say honestly that all of us to some extent um, resist this process and this journey. And I think the first thing that's really interesting to note in this story is that, you know, the Israelites don't just go straight into the promised land. You know, the actual physical distance wasn't actually great. And they certainly, it certainly wasn't a journey that was going to take 40 years. But um, the text says that quite interestingly, that sort of when they leave, uh, when they first leave Egypt, God says, interestingly, it says God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people round by the way of the wilderness towards the Red Sea. So there's a sense in which it seems that God says, actually, these people, they're not ready. They're not ready uh, to undergo this immediate transition. And I think probably all of us that have engaged in a journey of deeper change know that actually it does require time we can't instantly transition from one thing to the other there is this necessary wilderness process that has to happen and i think although i want to say that you know i don't want to say oh well we welcome the fact that our society is so resistant to change i think we do have to recognize that the kind of change we're looking at that's needed it does take time Although it's urgent, the reality is that any depth of change takes time. And that's true both for ourselves, but also for everyone else in our society. You know, and in some ways we need to have compassion for that, that this isn't an easy process and it is a journey. And we need to think about perhaps more about what, how can we encourage people to actually want to embrace a journey like that. Um, because I think that for every one of us, whether we're Christian or not, to embrace this journey of change does involve a process of spiritual formation. Um, because everyone is spiritually formed. It's, you know, everyone in our world is spiritually formed. We're spiritually formed by the culture and society that we're in. And change will involve, therefore, a process of spiritual formation. It's unavoidable. And I think some of the some of what I'm interested in is how particularly we as a church, how can we act as catalysts of this process of spiritual formation? How can we somehow encourage people that this wilderness might be a place we want to be? And also that actually the journey is toward a more beautiful a much more relational, a much more fulfilling way of living. So somehow this journey is really, really worth it. That's something about part of what will draw us, both the negative, but also the positive. So I think there is a need for each of us to embrace this process of spiritual formation in the wilderness. We recognize that as well as we're trying to change the world around us, we ourselves, are being changed and I think that's what Rachel was speaking to last week when she was talking about um Jacob wrestling with God this struggle <laughs> this process of change of formation and I you know we need to acknowledge that this process is not comfortable to enter the wilderness is to enter a place of deep struggle both within ourselves and with our society because we will encounter doubt. We will encounter uncertainty. We will encounter frustration. Um, it's deeply disruptive of our settled patterns. We're going to wrestle. We're going to question and we're going to wish it could somehow be easier. But that isn't the way of the wilderness. But it's also why it's only in the wilderness that we encounter God in a new way. It's only in the wilderness. 
Because what's really striking in the story of Exodus is that it's only when the Israelites have set out on their journey that God's presence becomes manifest to them. When they're in Egypt, they don't need to be led because they're not going anywhere. They don't need God. They're busy living without God in a way. I mean, they're in a situation of slavery, but for us, I think we could say that it's only in the wilderness that we start to encounter God in a new way. So in Exodus um, 13, so after they've, they've set out, literally right at the beginning, it says, and they moved on from Succoth and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness, right on the edge of the wilderness, they're just about to enter. And the Lord went before them by day, in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. So throughout this whole journey, God is present to his people as this cloud by day and this fire by night. And I think this is what's quite striking about the story. It goes right the way through the whole of Exodus. You know, we hear about a people <laughs> who are not that happy about being in the wilderness. <laughs> you know, they moan, they complain, they constantly doubt and question God. You know, they, they look back to Egypt and it's quite incredible because we think flippinec they're in this situation of slavery but they remember the pots of meat and all the nice food they got to eat and they frequently say to Moses why did you lead us out here just to perish in this blooming wilderness you know they're not it's it's a it's a people who are deeply conflicted about the journey that they're on they don't seem to be there a hundred percent but despite all of that God doesn't leave them and I think we can take comfort in that story that God never, ever leaves them right through so that the last verse, last verses of Exodus, uh, the sort of we hear about how the, the tabernacle, they create this tabernacle as the dwelling to, for God to dwell with them. And the, and the final verses of Exodus are this throughout all their journeys. Whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day and fire was on it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So this is, there is this tremendous picture of the faithfulness of God, despite all the people's uh, sort of fickleness and questioning and moaning and mumbling and grumbling. God remains faithful. And we do hear that actually a whole generation end up perishing in the wilderness. So there is something about for some of them, they never actually make the full journey. Um, and, and it has to be the next generation that actually make the journey. And there's something about this process of being in the wilderness um, in Hebrews, in the New Testament. You know, this, this story is particularly taken um, as a warning to us about something about the condition of our hearts that there's a danger in the wilderness, that because of the struggle and the fact that it's not easy, that somehow our hearts get hardened. And there's something about how do we keep our hearts open? How do we, so that, you know, the, the bit they quote from Psalm 95 is today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So there's something for us about how can we be in this place that might be inhospitable, but yet our hearts remain open um, uh, because the Israelites, um, you know, we kind of see that they actually, they seem to have a real problem with, um, with remembering <laughs> God in the wilderness. And, it, and it, the story is probably compressed, but we, you know, we see them coming across a situation where they, they lack something essential. So they, they're lacking water or they're lacking food. And they immediately start moaning and grumbling and putting real pressure on Moses. And then God meets them. You know, they, they have manna in the wilderness. They have quail. They have water from the rock. So 
in each situation, they reach something where something isn't there and they're desperate, but they seem to forget how God has provided. Um, so there's something there about um, the importance of memory and remembering and not forgetting. But also remembering that the wilderness, for this reason, the wilderness isn't easy. That it's a place where we're going to be stretched. The place we're in is a place of stretching. And that's not comfortable. Our faith is going to be stretched. We're going to not have everything we need. We're going to reach places where we're not sure how we're going to get what we need. It's not obvious. And we're going to encounter our own fragility, our own fears and our own weaknesses. That is all part of this place called the wilderness. But it's also the place where we grow. And it's also the place where I think we discover a life that's actually worth living. It's the place where we get to taste what life is really about because we don't get life in Egypt. So in our particular moment, we're not going to get life just by staying um, in the status quo. We won't um, encounter God in the status quo. So at the present time, we can only find the life we were made for by undertaking this wilderness adventure with others. It's the place where we discover how much we need others as well. And that not only do we need to change the world, but God is in this place within it of meeting us and changing us. So there's a lot that could be said around this story. I'm just going to say a couple of things um, just to bring out something. I think it's interesting that Jesus undergoes this um, journey of transition between his baptism by John the Baptist and him beginning his ministry. Uh, he goes into the wilderness for 40 days to fast and to seek God. And I think we could say that's Jesus's transition from being a relatively unknown carpenter from Nazareth into being the Messiah, the saviour of the world. Jesus himself undergoes some kind of journey of transition, a place where he himself is tested and shaped. He has to wrestle. Even Jesus doesn't get to miss this journey of transition. So I think we can also um, take courage from that. <laughs> if the son of God needs to undergo it, then we're going to also need to undergo this. It's, it's an unavoidable journey. And I think when we look at what Jesus, um, even Jesus has to learn, you know, he, he, he wrestles. We're, we're told that he's tested, he's tempted. And even Jesus has to learn this place of deeper dependence on God. Uh, he, he says, you know, he has to, his first temptation, he says, one does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. There's something about the wilderness where we have to learn at a deeper level to actually depend on God. And that's not easy or comfortable, but it takes us to a deeper place of faith and trust. And I think the other thing that happens to us in the wilderness is that inevitably we have to make space for what God alone can do because we are taken to the end of our own resources. So being in the wilderness does actually create a space for God to do what only God can do, for the change that only God can bring about. So although we act and we venture, we also within that process makes space for God to act. It's our action, our tiny little action, makes that space for God's action. And I think the other major learning in the wilderness is this sense of all, this deeper sense of what we're in this for. <laughs> There's a seminal moment in Exodus where the people of God have been spectacularly unfaithful. You know, Moses goes up the mountain to sort of uh, get the instructions for how they're gonna live, you know, this new kind of way of living. And, and the people kind of have this massive um, party and they start worshiping the calf and, you know, 
it's kind of, you know, it all goes horribly wrong. And, um, and then Moses has to go back and sort of seek God again after this sort of real moment of unfaithfulness. And it's a really seminal moment where God's, Moses is having this conversation with God and he sort of intercedes. And, and at one point in that conversation, God seems to say, look, it's OK, you can still go into promised land, but I'm not going with you. So it's almost like if we could say, right, we're going to get transition off fossil fuels, <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> But hang on a minute, God's not going to be with us. And Moses just says, well, actually, we, we're not, I don't want to go if you're not going to be with us. And there's something here where, um, where Moses is saying, actually, the whole point, God, is that you're with us. It's, it's about this, you uh, being with and present and in relationship. We don't want to make this journey on our own. We're just not interested. And he also says that there's no way that we're going to be distinctive unless you're with us. We're not going to have this different way of being without your presence. And then God says these beautiful words to Moses. God says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. My presence will go with you. So God promises, OK, I will go with you. And then this strange these strange words, I will give you rest. And when we hear those words, I don't know about you, but I sort of think about, you know, Jesus saying the same thing about his yoke. You know, if you will undertake to walk with me as your teacher, somehow in this mysterious struggle of life, I will also, I will promise you that I will give you rest. So there's this something about when God goes with us, we will also, as well as acting and working, we're also going to receive rest as well. So it's not to say there isn't struggle, but we're also going to receive a rest within it that I think is a sign that God is with us. There's something about there is a danger that we all know with climate action that we're going to burn out, that it's going to be too much. You know, we're going to be doing this in our own strength. So there's something here that's fundamental about this journey that we learn at the same time to rest in God's presence. To know that we can't do this without God. And we're not going to do this in our own strength. So in the midst of this turbulent time and increasingly turbulent times, where we are being called to act, to be faithful. I just want to sort of highlight, I guess what I, what I want to sort of emphasise is that, yes, we're called into the wilderness. <laughs> yes, it's going to test us. Yes, it's going to be challenging. But, but this is the place where life actually is going to happen for us. This is the place where we're going to learn what it means to journey with others. It's the place where we're going to encounter God more deeply. And we're also going to enter more fully into God's rest. So it's this paradox. My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. <laughs>